Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Kohani Rodatze. It is my pleasure to act as host of today's fascinating and significant discussion. This broadcast is sponsored by the Janusz Korteka Foundation and co hosted by the Polish Studies Program of Central Connecticut State University. <clears throat> my name is Mieczysław Piskupski, and I hold the endowed chair in Polish history at the university. Our Polish studies program, now almost 50 years old, has organized conferences and symposia and presented approximately 200 lectures and cultural events. It is an honor to work with the Kurtyka Foundation today, a fine addition to our long history. The basis of our symposium will be Poland and the First World War, an issue of fundamental importance in the history of the country. The war resulted in perhaps 16, 16 million deaths and countless more injured. The damage, both material and psychological, wrought is perhaps beyond measure. Europe was changed forever. It may well have been the most significant event in the modern history of the West. During the course of the war, the question of Polish independence, returning Poland to the map after more than a century of absence due to the partitions, indeed appeared. It was so complicated and required such dramatic changes to the continent that it is an issue of great importance indeed. For the Poles, of course, it was central to the very existence of the Polish nation. We shall examine the so-called Polish question of the era in three approaches. First, I shall make a few remarks about the Americans and Polish independence in the era which I have titled the Polish and American understanding of independence. My hope is to provide an introduction to my colleagues' presentations. Next, we shall have more detailed analyses by two distinguished scholars. This is a perfect moment to learn their analysis. Both have just won the Janusz, Janusz Korteka Prize for their newly published volumes in both English and German translation. First, Professor Andrzej Chwalba of the Jagiellonian University will discuss his monograph, Wielka Wojna Polaków, in English, The People of Poland at War, 1914-1918. He shall be followed by uh, Damian Markowski of the IPN, the Institute of National Remembrance the author of Dwa Powstania, Bitwa or Lwów, uh, or in English, Lwów or Lviv, Two Uprisings in 1918. These presentations will be followed by a period for questions and one hopes for answers. We shall begin our symposium with remarks by Pavel Kurtyka, president of the Janusz Kurtyka Foundation. Mr. Kurtyka. Distinguished professor, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I'd like to thank you, professor, for hosting this meeting and as a host, working with us and organizing this promotional event for the two books that the foundation has uh, published. Let me say a few words about the project as such, because I would like to tell you some words about the project that gathers us together and that since 2016 has made the foundation organize a competition. That's the Janusz Kurtyka Prize. This competition in a way follows a two-stage procedure of choosing the winning publication. The procedure ends with the peer re academic reviews so that our works are based on good historical research and also an interesting narrative that is understandable for us readers who come from the world of the West. And we want to make sure that this academic quality is there so that we can share the Polish history with the world in the best possible edition of that history. The books that win our uh, competition had already been published in the Polish market in the Polish language. And then the foundation uses this competition procedure to translate them and have them published in foreign 
publishing houses. Both these books, The Battle of uh, Lvov Lviv by Dr. Damian Markovsky and The Great War of Poles of Professor Andrzej Falba were victorious. They won our competition and they were published and first translated into English and German by Petter Lang Publishers. At the moment, our meetings are really the last phase of the competition and of the project, namely they are the promotion, the dissemination of the publications we've issued. We cooperate with academic centers and such meetings are co-organized both in the United States and also in centers in the United Kingdom, Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. In this way, our scope covers the leading English and German speaking countries. It's a reason for a great joy for me that we can talk today about the First World War. It is an exceptional time for Poland as Poland regained independence. And in the debate about the history of Poland, For the Polish public opinion, this is the time that is decidedly less present due to certain reverberations of the second of the world wars that are actually felt even today. Now, certainly the first world war, when it comes to this most important moment in it, which was the regaining of Polish independence, that war is, some may find it controversial, but it is more important because that fact brought the Republic of Poland to the map of the world. Today, we're going to examine that event from two perspectives. One is regional, the perspective of Lvov Lviv, one of the symbols of this fight for independence. And on the other hand, from the perspective of the entire territory of the Republic, but seen not from the military perspective or the perspective of diplomacy, but from the point of view of uh, an ordinary human, how people saw those military events, how people felt during this great war in the Polish territory. May I invite you cordially and wholeheartedly to this discussion? Let's listen to it together. I hope that what we have presented together with our partner is going to be really interesting for you. Thank you for your attention. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I have uh, a few remarks that should take me no more than three, four, or even five hours. Uh, it seems there are two ways of looking at America and the question of Polish independence. The first we shall call optimistic, the second realistic. The first begins by invoking fine examples in which positive features, events, or even people in American history are similar to Polish versions. This results in a sense of shared values, a common Weltanschauung. This is the traditional practice of explaining the Polish-American historical relationship in a manner which suggests historic friendship and traditions. The archetypical example is, of course, Kościuszko. He espoused democracy and human rights at the same time that the Americans were making similar proclamations. Of course, the fact that he was an adroit and inspiring military leader in the service of both Poland and America is the perfect juxtaposition. Kościuszko immediately involves Pulaski, the May 3rd Constitution was much influenced by the almost simultaneous American document, and both were the product of Enlightenment thought. Exhortations regarding liberty can be found in both, in both Polish Romantic and American patriotic song and symbol. The drama of an American war for independence and a war for approximately the same goals in Poland are emotionally bonding and raise the historic question about how Poland's disappearance at the same time America appeared has inevitably and eternally shaped their relationship. Based on what we may call the Kościuszko theme, we have a long series of similar links, though many dubious or misleading, that combine to suggest a peculiarly close Polish-American bond. This series of convergences, however, quickly come to the conclusion at the end of the 18th century. 
After Poland's disappearance in 1795, contacts with America were really non-existent for about a century. Fundamental moments in Polish history, for instance, the 1830 or 1863 Risings, meant nothing to America. Of course, the heroism and suffering of the Poles did not go unnoticed, but the result was brief episodes of sympathy and admiration. For the next two generations, Poland disappeared from American consciousness. This, of course, is completely reasonable. First is simple distance. Poland is a European country, America is not, and only feels a sense of cultural bonding with England. From the time of George Washington, the Americans have proclaimed the notion of no entangling alliances. This largely reflects the question of distance and essentially removes Europe from American interest. Of course, the farther east the nation is, the less it means to America, unless it is very powerful. That means the Americans really only care about Russia. Second, American culture was profoundly Anglo-Saxon and Poland was part of, uh, a part of Europe not developed under English Protestant culture. Hence, a lasting bond between England and America makes sense, one between America and Poland does not. To Americans, Poland offered no sense of shared values and traditions and the old Kościuszko theme faded into foggy symbols. Third, since Poland was without independence and occupied by the partitioning powers, economic or political links with America were really impossible. If Poland vanished from the mental geography of the European mind, to paraphrase Larry Wolf, for Americans, it might as well have been in another galaxy. Perhaps worsening the sad development was ironically, the large Polish immigration to America at the end of the 19th century. Although immigrant Poles were introduced to the American economy and therefore to American consciousness, remember who these Poles were. They were the most poor and uneducated children of Poland. In America, they took the most humble jobs, lived in the most shabby neighborhoods, and occupied the lowest place on the social ladder. For the Anglo-Saxon Protestant dominating population, they were regarded with disinterest and often even with disdain. American writers occasionally made reference to these Polish immigrants. It was always condescending, sometimes simply prejudicial. A good example of this are the remarks of Woodrow Wilson, in his writings before he became president, when he makes racist anti-Polish remarks. Worse, the Statue of Liberty refers to Poles and others as, quote, wretched refuse. In other words, when World War I broke out in 1914, there was not a strong foundation for American interest in restoring Poland's independence, only what remained of the distant Kościuszko theme. But this soon changed, or at least changed partially. From the very first day of the war in 1914, historic Polish territory was a scene of ferocious combat causing many civilian casualties, destroying economic assets and resulting in chaos. As bad as was 1914, 1915 brought many times the damage. Polish civilian casualties quickly rose to six figures. The Russians forced a population of cities like Warsaw to evacuate without much warning. They were, inevit they were inevitably plunged into hunger and rampant disease. Polish suffering became an international issue. The Americans, to their credit, tried quite early to survey the extent of the damage and devise methods to address the problem. Large organizations like the Rockefeller Foundation and the American Red Cross dispatched teams to investigate the Polish situation, and they sent back horrifying stories. These appeared in the American press. Prominent Americans, especially in New York City, created relief organizations and many prominent citizens joined. The Polish community in the United States, Polonia, was devoted to help their suffering countrymen in Europe. We could even argue that Polonia activities during the war were a major factor in bringing Poland before American eyes and advertising increasingly the notion of Polish independence. The Polish relief story became so large and so oft mentioned that members of the American Congress spoke about it on the floor of Congress, and most striking of all, the president, Woodrow Wilson, made appeals for aid to Poland, even designating a Polish relief day. This is significant because Wilson, who knew nothing of Poland, discovered it now in a manner which made the Poles a very emotional cause. In other words, the Americans first became interested in Poland as a result of the Poles becoming a so-called good cause. Once reintroduced into American consciousness, Polish symbols and episodes followed into the American mind. References to Kościuszko again became frequent, the pianist Ignacy Jan Paderewski, already known in America as a musician, now became the symbol of Poland. His Chopin concerts were really patriotic rallies, and non-Polish Americans became enraptured, 
cheering endlessly and making immediate financial contributions to Polish needs. Significantly, Podolski always included an eloquent case for Polish independence in his concerts. In other words, relief needs and Podolski and patriotism brought Poland back to the American mind and in a way to make the Polish cause, the restoration of independence, something the Americans were aware of and indeed supportive of. But we should be careful about overemphasizing the positive aspect of this phenomenon. First, the British did not want Polish relief needs to be discussed because much of their suffering was due to the Russians and the Russians were England's ally. Therefore, London diverted attention from Poland, where suffering was enormous, to Belgium, where suffering was mild and ended quickly. More important, the Americans donated little money, very little money to the Polish cause. Thus, by 1915, we have the Americans, led by Wilson, sympathetic to Polish relief needs and occasional declarations in favor of Polish independence are made. In 1917, just as the Americans are about to enter the war, Wilson endorsed the cause of Polish independence in the famous January 17th Peace Without Victory speech, quite possibly the only American president to ever issue such a statement. However, while the speech endorsed the idea of Polish independence as an important result of the war, it is a general statement without any specifics, not surprisingly at this stage of the war. In other words, what Wilson meant by independent Poland is not clear. It was not until 1918 in his famous 14 point speech that Wilson, now leading a country involved in the war, which America had entered in April, gave us a clearer vision of what he had in mind. It is at this point that we must question the already noted optimistic understanding of American support for the reestablishment of an independent Poland. First, Poland is to reemerge as an independent country and its sovereignty, sovereignty is to be guaranteed. That's fine. But soon problems arise. Wilson insisted that Polish territory would be determined not by historic guidelines, but by applying so-called ethnographic frontiers. How such borders are to be determined is not explained, but it soon became clear that the 1897 Russian census, hardly honest or fair regarding the Poles, was to be employed. Next, the Poles are to be given only what he called indisputably Polish territory, a term he never defined, but essentially means that all Polish uh, that all historic Polish territory, which is a substantial non-Polish population, will not be given to Poland. But then where will it go? Since Wilson never endorsed the creation of an independent Lithuania or Belarus or Ukraine, any territory not given to Poland would inevitably be given to a renewed Russian empire, which by 1918 was a communist Russian empire. Wilson, in the sixth of his 14 points, quite specifically endorsed the recreation of a Russian empire and no concerns whatsoever about including vast territories in the state in which the Russians had few, if any, inhabitants. In other words, Wilson's Poland would be ethnographic, but Russia would not have to be, and there will not be a Lithuania, a Belarus, or a Ukraine. What this means is that he wanted Poland to be independent, but only in a small, really very small size. At the same time, Russia would remain a huge imperial colossus, posing an overpowering threat to Poland. Whereas this is technically an endorsement of Polish independence, it is in a very form, is in a form very dangerous to Poland's security. When you add to this the fact that Wilson did not want Poland to have Gdańsk and wanted the new Poland to have very little territory from defeated Germany, American support for Polish independence becomes problematical. But it gets worse. Wilson insisted that Poland's security would somehow be guaranteed by the very vague League of Nations, but no specifics were provided as to how this would be possible. Poland's independence really depended on the League, and we do not know what the League could do to protect that independence. In some, the Americans endorsed Polish independence, but did not envision a Poland really capable of maintaining that independence. Hence, Whereas we may technically argue that America supported the cause of Polish independence, it did so in a form which made that independence very fragile. Indeed, while endorsing independence for a small Poland, Wilson celebrated a huge Russia and asked other countries to provide it with financial aid, but he asked no such aid for Poland. Finally, the Americans refused to join the League, making Polish independence very vulnerable indeed. Indeed, as I have argued elsewhere, the new Poland was really doomed from the start. How can we explain this paradox? The Americans endorsed the cause of Polish independence, but defined her independence in a way which puts the country in danger from its very rebirth. It ignored its geopolitical dangers and supported its traditional enemy, Russia. The answer is, I think, simple, 
but not an attractive one. Wilson and many other Americans sympathetic to Poland only supported the idea of an independent Poland, but never considered the consequences of such an endorsement. If a new Poland were not able to defend its existence, what would your endorsement of its independence really amount to? In my opinion, it was the politics of symbolism and really nothing more, a revived version of the Kościuszko theme earlier mentioned. In other words, the Americans supported the idea of an independent Poland, but regarded the issue as so unimportant that they never considered the necessities such an independence entailed. Poland was to the Americans in 1918 the same thing as it was to them during the Kościuszko era, an attractive cause and symbol, but one not sufficiently important to analyze. The Americans in 1776 or 1918 or 1945, or unfortunately perhaps in 2021, have never been sufficiently interested in Poland to formulate a clear policy towards the Polish question and be prepared to carry it out. Since the partition, since Kościuszko, the Americans have been often favorable to the attractive symbols of Poland, but unfortunately, Poland is not something they understand or concern themselves with enough to be enough. As a result, American support for Polish independence may have fine moments. Under Wilson, it helped greatly in placing Polish independence before the world's consciousness, but what did it really mean? Indeed, we may argue that Wilson played a large role in placing Poland in the diplomatic conversation in the world, but stop here. Independence is not really independence if it is not based on a solid basis. Was it ever more than the politics of symbolism? Was it ever a geopolitical calculation? Has America ever really supported the reality and not just a symbol of an independent Poland? Thank you very much. And now it is my pleasure uh, to introduce Professor Andrzej Chalba. I'm afraid you must unmute yourself, uh, Mr. Chalba. Excuse me, my fault. Um, um, jestem wzruszony, że I am moved. I'm really happy that today's meeting is moderated by Professor Biskupski from the US. His books here in Poland, in the academic circle, are well known, highly valued, and widely discussed. His books have opened to us here new horizons. His is an American point of view. In his address just a moment ago, we've heard themes that were related to how the US sees Poland and Central Europe in general. And basically, you could hear it quite well. Let me just add something here, because here today, we're supposed to discuss how Poland understands independence. And it is quite special, quite original. It stems from this uh, heroic and complex history of ours. And there is this strong romantic element there which surely was not present in the US, at least to this extent, and neither was it present in this form in Europe. Now, what stayed in our memory about what Americans did about the Polish independence? So Wilson, yes, he is in our collective memory as a creator, as the person responsible for the Polish independence, after all, he was the first allied leader who so clearly, without any doubts, expressed his views in his address. And there, he said that there is such a need for a certain country to return, even though it had been absent for over 100 years. It's difficult to forget such an address because by doing so, Wilson, forced the Western allies, um, 
the British and the French to speak on that matter. Let's just consider that the creation of a new state. That's what we're talking about. And what follows is a revolutionary change in the European borders. Do diplomats love revolutions on the map? Not really. So what do we remember about Wilson? Well, in Compiègne, this is where the Western Front War was finished. I mean, these, this is something that Wilson prepared. And there we can read in these documents that Central Europe is largely being decomposed and that is the issue of the creation of Poland with the access to sea. So Gdańsk, was it supposed to be a Polish city or not? It's not something that we are sure of. Wilson never expressed it clearly. Basically, he changed his point of view depending on the situation. I agree with you, Professor. However, in the Polish, what we Poles remember, we historians remember quite clearly is another American historian, Hoover, Herbert Hoover, quite an amazing president, an amazing character. Similarly to Wilson, he was also an idealist, although somewhat different. For him, what was important was to be, to show solidarity, to stand in solidarity with those in need. And he remembered full well that he got funds from a pianist and composer, Jan Paderewski, at the time he himself was rather poor, and he was looking friends and said friends with Paderewski. He was also friends with Wilson. So Hoover's institution helped Poland, but also Serbia and Belgium. This assistance was quite significant. We are talking about thousands, if not millions, of various items, artifacts, products, and you know was excess thereof in the US. All these products go to people that have nothing to wear because this is the landscape of Poland destroyed by the war. You mentioned the year 1914, that those economic resources were being systematically destroyed. Poland and Serbia, Serbia being a country in the south of Europe, those two regions were the most destroyed by war. Also, due to villages and towns, what they looked like, because basically they were built of timber at the time. Hoover reacted very fast indeed. And by 20, 1920, this help saved thousands of lives, including those of children. He was very sensitive to the welfare of children. Which is why I'm surprised that the Aglian University, where I teach, gave him Dr. Tonos Causa and Herbert Hoover actually experienced the following thing. The year is 1938. The pressure in Europe is growing. It's endangering peace. The atmosphere is getting thicker. Hoover arrives. And here in Krakow, there is this magnificent party a Polish-American meeting is organized. Hoover spoke quite clearly to us, that is Americans, basically, yes, we are isolationists. Yes, we are no longer interested in Europe, but we still remember about you. We will remember about you. And we Poles, we are a nation which are especially sensitive to the issue of sovereignty. We also do remember. At the end of the 18th century, the Napoleonic era, Europe is experiencing an earthquake, a powerful earthquake. The changes on the map could be compared to what is happening in the weather and the climate. So this is the first earthquake. And there is another earthquake 
in the period that precedes the World War in the Balkans and during the Great War in the years 1914-1918. So the first earthquake. One significant countries fall, Venice, Genoa, and the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth falls too. And over 250 German states collapse as well. After all, the Reich was fragmented at the time. Before, Hungary and Czechia had fallen as well. So next to the, po the Kingdom of Poland, by the way, Piotr Vanich from Yale actually writes, wrote about it, this late professor and expert in international relations. So he wrote about the Kingdom of Hungary, the Kingdom of Czechia, the Kingdom of Poland. He shows the unity of Central Europe and something that sets us apart, historically speaking. How is this manifested? Through our being sensitive, extra sensitive to the issue of independence, sovereign. So we are extra sensitive, but history taught us to really observe politicians very closely, to watch what they're doing, what they are saying, how they're acting, to read their intentions really well. That's what we've been taught. So now let's take a look. We have European countries, European nations, they regain independence in 1918, 1920, because the pro it's a process that lasts at least two years. There is no more room for the German states. Germany is united. No more room for the once great genuine and Venice Republic that are part of the Kingdom of Italy. There is, though, room for Poland. It's going to come to be, but the borders are still unclear. Wars will have a say in there. The most important one will be against the Soviets who are marching towards Europe. That is the heart. They are marching towards the heart of Europe at the time. So let's move on to this second earthquake. As a result, nations that had had their own states, I mean, Czechs and Hungarians, now they have their own sovereign states. However, Hungarians paid quite a high price first for the communist revolution and then for the fact that they fought hand in hand with the Germans because their territory is largely curtailed. Czechoslovakia, though, comes to being consisting largely of Slovaks. Never before had such a Slovak country existed. Never be before had there been a Latvian or Estonian state before. So we see countries which form new nations, nations that stem from peasant circles. So there was no co historical continuity there. Now, when it comes to Poles, we had had some continuity of the Polish culture. We're fortunate enough there. The Polish Knights of for Freedom, the people who participated in the Polish uprising in 1831, they were welcomed enthusiastically as those who carry on this torch, this idea of freedom. So Poles, Polish revolutionaries, Polish rebels, passed it on to Europe. We love freedom and we want to give it to you as a gift. Too. This was the time when another interesting concept was formed, will become a part of the Polish uh, history. The concept of solidarity. Well, it is well known due to the 1980s solidarity. There was this credo for our freedom, for your freedom and ours, for your freedom and ours. So Kościuszko was mentioned by Professor Biskupski. Kościuszki didn't know this motto, and yet he followed it for your freedom and ours. So we need to stand in solidarity because freedom is something that can be divided. We cannot sell it, we must not neglect it. So 
19th and 20th century history has equipped us in certain instruments that help us to identify threats. What are the, what were those threats? After we remained independent, independence, excuse me, the first threat was the Red Army and this huge Soviet Russia, or this Soviet system, Bolshevik system. And this system was attractive to millions of people in the world because they seemed to promote a new vision of a man, working man, liberated man, who would and this Soviet uh, power was supposed to serve man, but it didn't. So it was a story of threat and danger, and it was a story that was passed on by us to Europe, to the US. Now the question is whether the world wanted to listen to us. Some did, and they drew correct conclusions. Now, moving on to the Second World War, another Polish experience. This was a cruel, dramatic German occupation, which made us even more sensitive to this freedom. Communism comes later. Poland uh, are, is in, better, in a better situation that uh, Georgians or Armenians or Latvians or Lithuanians because those nations were a part of the Soviet Union, but yet we were a part of a greater empire, so we didn't feel dependent and free. Independence is regained, well, largely through a stroke of fortune. We were as fortunate as in 1918. But to stay fortunate, you have to pay attention to those things. So coming back to 1914, this is when war breaks out. It did not look really promising back then. So it did not look like we were going to have a Hollywood-like happy ending. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Hvalba. It is my understanding that I should now like to turn the uh, attention to our colleague, Professor Markovsky. Distinguished professors, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I'm not a professor yet, but I'm taking your words for a good omen. And ladies and gentlemen, we have already mentioned this understanding of freedom on a macro scale. May I now tell you, if I may, some words about the micro scale. I'll start from the fact that in 1921 in Poland, a very extensive campaign started. It extended to millions of Polish citizens there were those books of gratitudes of the Polish nation for the American nation for support during the Great War and also after its uh, close. The signatories included also several hundred of veterans who contributed greatly to the forging of one of the key founding myths of the Second Republic of Poland. They were the young defenders of Lvov from the Ukrainian uh, armies when in November 1918, the Ukrainian army captured uh, Lvov. It's not going to be any discovery if I say that every nation needs its myths, be it the founding myth, be it also heroic ones, which are the foundation for your pride, but also for your identity, the values that are to help you also during the war or crisis. At the end of this great war, the need for the myth in Europe became greater than ever. I will 
go maverick and say that these myths became of primary importance for the states that as yet had no countries of their own. That is something that prior to that was based on tales of the uh, victory, Polish victories of the forefathers. For example, in the 17th century, we can read it all in the books of Henryk Sienkiewicz or for the Ukrainian side, the Cossacks who loved the freedom and who had their in inverted commas roots in the days of Kievian Rus, while replacing the old myths with the new ones. That may sound brutally. That was favored by bloodshed, by bloodshed in the fight for defining the uh, borders of those new statehoods built on the debris of the old empires. That's why when Polish-Ukrainian fight for the belonging of Lvov, then Eastern Galicia, then Volhynia to the Polish state, or perhaps to Western Ukraine, Poland obtained one of the main founding myths. Poland, which in fact was not yet there. It was only being rising from the rubble of the empires that had previously broken it apart. It was Lvov in whose streets the first shots were fired, the armed struggle so that where the Polish soldier stands, Poland has its borders. That's when Poland gained one of its founding myths, not to count the myth of the legions of Józef Piłsudski before. Now, each myth takes a hero. It needs a hero. It's a collective one this time. The eaglets of Lwów, were they expected? Were they in need? They surprised really the whole Poland and especially the Polish authorities with their arrival, with the coming. The Polish Liquidation Committee believed that the takeover of Lwów will be different, more administrative than armed fight. In result, the Polish party was surprised by the Ukrainian armies and only that Polish resistance was solidifying in the streets and mashing successive Polish people, including plenty of Polish youth and children, lower secondary school children, that gave rise to the myth. Out of 622 defend 6,220, 1,421 were under 17, so they were children. 2,640 of them were juniors, young adults, 18 to 25. What was a typical figure helping to shape this legend, to create that myth? May now quote memories of one of the participants in these fights. On the 5th of November, ordered by the commander of Section 3, I had different functions in Konarski School, one of the resistance centers. There was this little boy with energy in his eyes. He wanted to join the army. The commander asked him about the age and then permit from the parents. The first was insufficient. He was 12. So he was class two of the lower secondary school. Now the second was absolutely bad. He was to go to so-called potato uh, army. He was to help. He was swallowing tears and he worked to this accessory service. He couldn't even dream about a gun. We knew only his first name. He was Mietek. He was a courier. He was the right hand of a commander who knew that Mietek could be sent everywhere and he would fulfill every task. At night, I would see his silhouette in two long mantle with a gun, which was really greater than him. 
he would escape somewhere with another boy. I met him at the most dangerous outpost. Of course, that's one of the bright pages of this myth, the heroic, the one showing this uh, fiery patriotism of children, devotion. But there is also the obverse of that medal, namely a card that makes it possible to ask a question whether children should go to war. And it causes more questions because it asks how the psyche of those children is later shaped. Now, a student of class four primary school, he was 10 at the time, recalls how he was carrying weapons and munitions to one of the outposts. At the time, I was just thinking how to destroy the Russians, and I was only furious when I saw a dead body of a Polish legionary. These were hard and sad days for me when I saw how a Polish soldier was suffering when he was wounded and when there was never anything to eat. Finally, the Polish party won. However, that was at a huge cost and entailed huge losses. Nonetheless, we can see here that propaganda of the Polish state being born at the time really mm, passed the test when it came to the explanation of how children reached for the weapons. From a charge, it turned into a positive aspect. That myth was later cemented with each myth and uh, month by the Polish press, central, but also local, which received various articles, materials from the military correspondence from Lwów and vicinity, saying that Poland in Lwów managed to be saved with the hands of the children and young people, which was not fully true because the number of regular soldiers in the defense of Polish uh, Lwów was growing. It was on the rise, yes, but the argument was used that these were the children who were defending Poland, this new creation, new growth, that the nation took arms and it was led by the children. Members of the Allied military mission who arrived in Warsaw and in Lwów were told about that they included Joseph Barthelevy, a French general who said that in the streets of the city he saw armed children and armed women, and they made a special impression on him, and they uh, reinforced his belief that this should be a Polish city. Books were gradually being published that sang the uh, victorious deeds of the eaglets, true and also fictitious deeds. There were tales, radio stories, and finally that myth of the eaglets became a part of the most important state official moments in the Second Republic of Poland. The first were still at the battlefield when the dead were praised and there were enchantments made that their blood must spring the Polish state and Polish Lwów. With time, that also received spiritual dimension. In November 18, just six days after Ukrainian army was repelled in the uh, Lwów Cathedral, there was a solemn uh, mass in grat organized in gratitude. Soon one was organized in the Church of St. Mary Madeleine. Józef Piłsudski, the Polish marshal, greatly contributed to the development of that legend. And on the 22nd November 1920, he officially um, ordered, gave the order of Virtuti Militari to uh, the city, and he pinned the order to the plaster coat of arms of the city. Soon in the same November, the first great 
post was ceremony devoted to the defense and to the victory when children from the Lvov schools did not have to go to schools. There were parades of the veterans, but also scouts and young people from schools. As far as the development of the myth is concerned, also uh, torn away from the reality and the actual facts, we should perhaps quote the mm, facts from the 15th anniversary of fight for Lviv when the defenders were compared to the mythical heroes of antiquity whose power of spirit uh, won over the power of uh, the prevailing enemy. That was not true. We know that the president, the mayor of Lviv, Zdrojanowski said it was not only the triumph of the weapons, bravado, uh, soldierly movement of a heart that was also, if not primarily, the victory of the human over himself, of the most beautiful instincts of the great devotion and uh, readiness to uh, sacrifice yourself, the victory of the heroic element in the human spirit on your fear and on the cautious and judicious weighing of opportunities after several years of the Great World War. The defense of Lvov therefore started with the same spiritual powers which made Poland independent and which are incarnated in Józef Piłsudski, this thread in which it was emphasized that Lvov was in the avant-garde of developing the Polish state and received its due place in this myth was also emphasized by the deputy mayor, Stanisław Ostrowski, who wrote, was the, the whole Polish Lwów on our side? They were a group of born romantic soldiers who had the will of victory. The others were just bread eaters who had the souls of small uh, shop owners. The first created the foundations for victory. They turned an ephemeral being into the city of action. In turn, one of the defenders of the city in a later phase of the uh, fight, General Rozwadowski in January 26 wrote, for you need to emphasize that a heroic deed of the young and such a great military effort of the total society made a decided impact on both the consolidation of our army and of the Polish state. I'd like to use this opportunity of the celebrations that I've mentioned to discuss also the um, shaping the forming of the public of the social space of Lvov to emphasize the significance of the defense of the city, both in the local and in the national sense. There was this famous Lvov Camposanto, the cemetery of the defenders of Lvov, where young people and children from all over the country were taken to. There were also smaller monuments in Persenkovka and Vinniki. There were also plaques. What remained in the shadow of that myth was this instrumentization of that memory. There were controversies, quite a lot of those, who laid greater services during the November fighting, and also how strongly politically involved were the individual veterans and how uh, strongly were fighting later in the parliament, the former brothers in arms. They were no longer uh, connected with the same idea and they were not united by the common enemy. There was also the Polish-Ukrainian war of anniversaries during the um, anniversary observations. There were quite big riots and tumults during which people were killed and wounded on both sides. Now the significance of the myth of the eaglets 
flashed perhaps for the last time in September 1939, when in the face of the Soviet aggression, these were the eaglets of Lvov who were made the paragon, the role model by the officers and politicians defending Lvov, Lvov and Grodno. The copying of that myth proved impossible at the time. With time, the events of the Second World War certainly dimmed the previous myth, one of the founding myths of the Polish state. The uh, generation of Kolumbowie appeared and they replaced the eaglets for the generations of post-war Poles. After the successive regaining of independence by Poland was a return of mm, return to this myth as we partially return to the traditions of the interwar Poland. That's what I wanted to say as introduction into the subject. I'd like to encourage you to dis to a discussion and to ask questions. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much for that fascinating paper, Mr. Malakowski. Uh, I would like to ask a question of each of our speakers before I open the door to uh, other questions. Uh, first, uh, Mr. Khvalba, I have... Uh, can you hear me, Mr. Khvalba? You can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. Oh, good. Mr. Khwaba, I have uh, an extraordinarily difficult question for you. Please forgive me before I ask it. And that is this, uh, from the perspective of today, 2021, would you say that in 1918, Poland was restored or was it created? Thank you. It was created and restored. There is no conflict between the two, as it was restored, the Polish statehood was restored. Statehood as an entity of international law, the state as, that has a territory, its own authorities, government, and its population. That was not a state that would have existed prior to that. So there was a continuity. The continuity simply continued. It was maintained. That was the second republic after the first. It had different our borders. It was the century of nations and not only one estate, the noble estate, as that used to be in the centuries preceding the fall. The state that in the East had to express its concession to the uh, independence of such nations as the Lithuanians, the Latvians, and also encouraged to it the Ukrainians by an alliance with Petlura's people's Ukraine. Also, in this way, it supported the independence of Belarus. Now, Belarus had very modest elites when the Republic, during the demise of the Commonwealth called the First Republic, there was no Lithuanian nation, not as ethnicity, as ethnos, but as cultural. There was no Belarusian, no Latvian. From the point of view of the ruling estate, Polish meant noble. I'm a noble, so I'm a Pole. I'm a Pole because I'm a noble. So all the subjects, whatever language they spoke, 
whatever uh, was their denomination and confession, they were not Poles, they were subjects. And in 1918, the subjects spoke their own language and they were subject, not an object of history, they were the subject. In this sense, this is an entirely new Poland, democratic, following the rule of law, respecting the laws also of women. After all, Poland was one of the first states, it did it even before the United States, that awarded the rights to all the women, voting rights included. Thank you. I'm not sure if you fully agree with my explanation, but we may always disagree on certain things. Well, we can he hear me now? Well, of course, we may disagree, but if we ever disagree, uh, you're wrong and I'm right. <laughs> so thank you very much for your fascinating answer, my colleague. Uh, now, if I might, I have a question for our colleague, Mr. Dr. Markowski, and that is this. Uh, in your fascinating discussion of the relationship between Poles and Ukrainians in Wuf in 1918, at the end of 18, beginning of 19, I noticed that you uh, didn't say much about the uh, issue of uh, Jewish difficulties in the city at the time. How significant was the uh, behavior of, of the Poles and the Ukrainians regarding the Jewish minority in the city? Was that a minor issue? Was that an important issue? How would you evaluate that? And here, we've arrived at yet another issue. Thank you, Professor, for this very interesting question. Thank you for touching upon this very important subject. Polish-Ukrainian fights start, begin in the streets. And Jews, after Poles, are the second group in Lviv. They accounted for 30% of the population in 1918. So they are facing as a community a dilemma. What do we do? Who do we side with? How best to secure our possessions? I do not mean in the context of statehood because they, there were no postulates of this type, but what do we do as a society so that we lose as little as possible and so that at the same time we can preserve what we gained? The Jewish committee is set up at the time that is supposed to take care of this Jewish community. And a Jewish militia is also set up. As an armed group, it's supposed to defend the community. The members of this militia participate in fights on the Ukrainian side. However, it is not so clear cut, to be honest. Now, let's look at why they did that. So it was not so much that they favored Ukrainians in the creation of the statehood. It's, it was more mostly about self-defense. At the time, the Polish forces, Polish troops, well, it was not, um, these were not regular soldiers, but they would act terribly sometimes they would rape and plunder and pillage. So the, it's a bit of a vicious circle. It's a spiral and Ukrainian troops make it possible for them to defend themselves. This Jewish militia with time begins to participate actively on the Ukrainian side. And then there is a, a retribution because there is this bloody pogrom, at least 79 victims. I'm not sure which direction I should go to at this point so that you, Professor, feel satisfied. Do I tell you about what happened, what they did to Jews in this mid-war period? Just to sum up what I've been saying now, this is a, very, a rather dark chapter of this Polish founding myth. 
one of its goals was to overshadow the memory of this pogrom. And the Polish propaganda was actually successful in accomplishing that in this mid-war period. Thank you very much for that thoughtful answer. Uh, at this point, with the cooperation of our hosts from the Kurtyka Foundation, I should like to ask whether or not we have any questions from, shall we say, outsiders available to us. Yes, we do. Let me see. Uh, that's not a question. Do we have any questions at all? If we don't have questions, uh, Mr. Markovsky and Mr. Khvalba, what that means is your presentations were so fantastic and unbelievably good that no one could possibly come up with a question. So therefore, there's no question they could put before us. Uh, if that is indeed, uh, if that is indeed the, the situation we're facing now, uh, let me conclude with this, these remarks. Uh, it was uh, an honor to act as chairman of the session. I'm very grateful to, to the Kurtyka Foundation for asking me to do so. It's an honor to the Polish Studies Program here at the university. Uh, and it is a personal compliment to me that I was able to hear uh, such thoughtful and well-considered presentations regarding such issues of vital importance to our common fatherland. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Ze swojej strony w imieniu Fundacji Janusza Kurtyki chciałbym podziękować Kurtyka Foundation. I would like to thank Professor Falba and Dr. Markowski for their participation in this debate and an especially warm welcome to Professor Biskupski, a rather especially warm thank you for the co-organization, the moderation of this event. Let me also thank you, the team of our foundation who have been supporting the organization of this meeting, this video conference, if you will. Let me also thank the interpreters who have made this debate possible. That is, who have made this debate possible in two languages. We have heard a number of spot on statements, and now let me ask Professor Falba to say a few words and also understand that Professor Dr. Markowski will take the floor. Let me once again thank you, Professor, thank you to the foundation. This is the second uh, episode in this trip around the US. And this is not so much a soap opera, but rather proper opera that is packed with academic interesting bits of information. I'm happy to see that we see more publications about the Polish Jewish relations, about the history of um, Poland and the history of our neighbors. And there are more and more of them in the US. There are awards presented for the best works on the history of a country, which is, let me just say, a bit unconventional. Maybe not so much exotic, but unconventional, because it is somewhat different. It has a special history and its own special sensitivities, different from those countries and those nations that have this continuous sense of statehood. Those countries that have lost their statehood at a certain point will have this different sensitivity, and it has been said today. It is also important for the US students, well, it's good to look at Europe also through the prism of those countries 
that have had to fight for this continuity of statehood and sometimes they've been lost it and yet ultimately those countries have become a part of this modern democratic world ladies and gentlemen i can i couldn't put it better than professor falba so could say that again but i would like to thank both professors professor biskupski the moderator too and the whole team of the anushkatika foundation without them this all would not have been possible and we can see this huge added value because we can share here what we know we can share certain knowledge we can discuss important issues with academics from all over the world this is i believe the best path to look at history as it is and to exchange information thank you thank you indeed Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for this meeting, for being with us. And we would like to invite you to follow our next events organized by the Foundation. There will be more such events to follow. I'm sure they will be interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you.